you'll open your Bible to them. Acts 1 and uh, we'll go ahead and read from the first verse. And uh, this is, uh, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, and to day, until the day in which he was taken up, after he had through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John for John truly, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, thank you. So we've we've begun. Did you get an outline? We've begun uh, to study the, the book of Acts, and there's a an outline on this first section in uh, in the front of the church. You need one. Raise your hand, we'll get you one. And last week we were closing. As we closed, we were looking at how it says in verse 2 that it was through the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave these commandments. Okay? And Jesus really ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's important for you to understand. It's a beautiful blending of the Trinity because in Christ's ministry, he was an individual in the Trinity, and yet he only did his Father's will, correct? So you have Christ, you have the Father, and then he did it in the and he did his ministry in the energy of the Spirit. All three reflected. The whole Trinity was active in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But what he did, his actions were by the power of the Holy Spirit. We discussed that situation in Matthew 12 when the Pharisees came uh, to their great uh, intelligent conclusion and they accused Jesus of doing his miracles by the power of the devil, remember? And Jesus was very upset about that accusation because they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He wasn't that upset if they had blasphemed him. He was used to that. But he was upset because they had blasphemed the Spirit. It was through the Spirit that things were done in the ministry. So the Holy Spirit was ministering through Jesus Christ. So we might think, we might ask, why did the Trinity do it that way? Well, most obviously, I think for one reason, to give you and I a great example of how it is to be that uh, the Spirit of God wants to work through us on a daily basis. As the Spirit works through Christ, uh, God wants us to understand that the Spirit should work through us. The Spirit of God ministered through Christ. That's a tremendous truth. And it even tells us in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 9, that the death of Christ in his crucifixion involved the Holy Spirit. All right? Uh, Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God. The Spirit was even active in the crucifixion. It was uh, in the death of Christ. And so Jesus has set the pattern for us on how to function with the Spirit leading us in our lives. Jesus Christ operated in the power of the Spirit. And he's God. And so how much do we need to operate in the power of the Spirit? That's the idea. Okay, There's a pattern. Uh, there's a pattern for you and I to see there. And so, in the scripture that we're, we've read today, it says he taught. And who did he teach? His apostles. Okay. Uh, and what? And how did he? How did these apostles come to be? He had chosen them. He taught the ones that were called to be his own. He chooses. Christ chooses his ministry. Uh, his missionaries. He chooses his own, and then he commissions them. He teaches them. He gifts them with spiritual gifts, and he sets them into a body in certain positions of leadership. 
and then he expects them to do their job. And you notice that he chose them. That's a, that's a comforting thought. It's a beautiful thought. It's one of the wonderful things about being a Christian is to know that, that you have been chosen by him. Jesus said in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Okay? So it is that we have been chosen and appointed and placed in the body with certain gifts and certain ministries as these were as uh, just as Jesus ministered were the same way. We're just little Jesus. Now, what are we saying we're supposed to begin with in this, in this idea that we're talking about? We're saying that to be effective, you, first of all, you've got to be in the Word, okay? You've got to be saturated with the Word. Uh, I love to read Spurgeon's old sermons. Spurgeon said this. Spurgeon said we might preach until our tongue rotted. We might preach until we exhaust our lungs and die. But never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit uses the word to convert the soul. Okay? We, I can say whatever I want to. It's the Spirit that will convict. And he, said, he also said it, was blessed, he said it was blessed to eat into the very heart of the Bible until at last you come to talk in a, spirit, a scriptural language and that your spirit would be flavored with the words of the Lord so that your blood is... Your blood is bibbling, which is a very unusual word, bibbling, not bubbling, bibbling, uh, and the very essence of the Bible flows from you. Those are Spurgeon's words. And bibbling means to be, uh, I don't know, I'm really, it means to be, yeah, kind of bubbling, but it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a little bubble, a bit of bibble. Rather than a bubble, it's a bubble. It's a Bible. Amen. It's a Bible. It's a Bible bubble. A bubble bubble. A bubble Bible. A bubble bubble. So, uh, but the idea is that uh, we're supposed to be saturated with the message of God. And the message just flows, has then the opportunity to flow in and out of us. And it gushes out of us. And, and that's what he's saying. I think that bibbling is the idea of gushing out of you. And so Jesus gave them a proper message. He taught them, and he taught them, and he taught them, and because he's like me, he taught them. He had to teach them a lot. And in great measure, dear ones, your effectiveness depends on what you know and what you've been able to transfer from here, from what you know. Remember, we said you've got you to know it, but then you have to transfer it into the pattern of your life. Okay? You take a proper message, you learn it, and then you, 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 you take that and you transfer that message into your life. You apply it to your life. You live it in your life. Secondly, then, the second thing in your outline should be the proper manifestation. And in verse 3 it says, To whom also, that means to, to whom also is those that he had chosen, remember? He didn't, so who did he appear to? Those that he had chosen. He didn't appear to other people. That's a pretty important point. He didn't appear to everybody. He didn't appear to any unbelievers. And we get when we get to uh, our God, our study of the Gospel of John sometime soon, we'll emphasize the fact that Jesus didn't go around making miraculous appearances to convince the unbelieving. Because you know how Jesus convinces the unbelieving? That's how he convinces the unbelieving. All right? By convincing you and me and then empowering us to do the job. So he appeared, it says, he appeared only to those that he had chosen. He presented himself alive after his suffering. Some versions will use the word passion. By many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. Okay, so we'll stop right there for this point. So it's important for these people that he is appearing to. He wants them to really believe, and they, he wants them to have a confidence that Jesus is a risen Lord, right? Okay. I mean, who wants to go out and preach a gospel of a dead leader? You know, are, are you, you know, are you?
you with me on that idea? Who wants, who wants to do that? Who wants to go out there and say, I'll die for Christ because he's dead for me? That's not the idea. You know, uh, Christ is alive. No one wants to go out and announce to the world a, a dead Jesus Christ. So we didn't need to know what, that he's alive and that he lives today in power. And we need to know that or else there's really no reason for us to go out and propagate the gospel. Why would we go out if he wasn't alive? Uh, you know, I've said many times in our study of the Word of God that one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the boldness and commitment of the early church to preach that Christ was alive. They were bold. They, were, they went to the extreme to preach the gospel. Uh, and one of the reasons they did that is because they had seen him in his resurrection glory. And so it says in verse 4, he gave them this, this I'm, I'm calling it a proper manifestation. He revealed himself to them. They had not, they had not seen him. Uh, if they had not seen him post-resurrection, I don't think they would have ever, have ever made it. Christianity wouldn't have made it. They would have walked away. Peter, remember Peter, Peter had seen him once and he had already gone back to fishing. Okay? He wasn't very good at it, but he had already gone back to fishing. So, uh, Christ, during this 40-day period, repeatedly permitted them to see him. That's what it means. Many and many infallible proofs over 40 days. He just kept repeating his presence with them. And you'll notice it says, he had to, it, the idea is that he had to present himself. He had to show himself uh, in, in verse 3 because they couldn't perceive him in his glorified body unless he opened their eyes. He had to allow them to see who he was. And so he gave them this proper manifestation. And if you want a, uh, a list of who he came to, you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. And Paul says he was seen by, it says there, he was seen by Cephas, he was seen by Peter, then by the twelve. And after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the, the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all he was seen by me also, Paul writing, as one born out of it, out of due time. So Jesus knew they needed to see who he was, and, and, and of course by the time you get to John 21, 12, it says, and, and John 21, 12 is, is very important. It says, nobody dared ask him, meaning Jesus, who art thou? Nobody would ask that question. It says that, that they were knowing that it was the Lord. They knew. By that time they had seen him enough. They didn't even, they didn't even question it. They were sure of who he was. They were convinced. They were not deceived. They knew it was the Lord Jesus Christ. They had seen him because he had manifested himself to them. And then there's a, this footnote in verse 3. It says, And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that's the final proof that he gave them of who he really was. Why? Well, because he just... What he did was, is he had been teaching them and teaching them and teaching them while he was alive, correct? So then he died, he was resurrected, and then what did he do? He just took up the same lesson. It's like uh, last week, lesson three, I gave you lesson three in Acts. And then if I had died, if I had been resurrected, and I came back and I taught you lesson four. That's what Jesus did. He just continued to teach what he had already taught. Because he picked up those same lessons that he had, he had given before his death. And he continued right on from there. They, and that was a proof to them. They knew it was Jesus because they saw him. They touched him. They ate meals with him. They talked with him. And all of that. But they also knew it was because Jesus. Because when he started to talk, he didn't speak something different. He talked the same things that he had talked before. And you know what? He wanted them to know that the crucifixion, that all that took place at the cross, never deterred him from the kingdom that God had promised. He wanted them to understand that kingdom is still coming. Don't give up that thought. So he came to, you know, Jesus had come to announce the kingdom to Israel, didn't he? He told, he told them, the 
the kingdom of God was at hand. Uh, a physical, literal, millennial kingdom. And they rejected him because he wasn't the king they wanted. And they killed him. And then the, when that happened, the disciples began to wonder, well, how in the world do you put together a dead leader with a king? How does that work? That doesn't figure out, probably. Something's going to happen. If you've got a, he's talking to us about this kingdom of God, but now he's dead, so that something has to happen in the middle there. Something else has to go on for it, there to be a kingdom. And what happened was the resurrection. He rose from the dead, and their confidence was restored, and now they're seeing him. He's coming around and talking to them and eating with them. And he came back, and what, he did, what did he teach them? He taught them, in essence, remember, I'm a king. And there's a kingdom coming. And do you think they believed him? Their actions would say they definitely believed him. And he taught them that the things concerned... I personally think that he taught them things uh, in a millennial sense. And, and that he opened up their eyes to things in a millennial way. But the, and the kingdom is God, of God is, is a very broad thing. The kingdom of God includes all the spiritual truths in the realm of God's understanding and God's dealing with men. And the kingdom of God even includes the mystery kingdom. The mystery form of the kingdom. Do you know what that's called? The mystery form of the kingdom. That's what it is referred to as the church age. This is the mystery form of the kingdom of God, the church age. And I'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 2. So I'm not going to talk much about it now. But the scope of God's dealing with men under the category of the kingdom of God involves how God has dealt with men in the past, how God deals with men today in the mystery kingdom of the church age, and how he will deal with men with the great kingdom on earth, the millennial kingdom, and then the eternal kingdom. And he wanted them to be reminded that he was a king and that the kingdom was coming. And so it's, it's a beautiful confirmation to them that not only, was, not only did, did he look like he was supposed to look, but he also said what he was supposed to say. You know, if he, had, if he looked like Jesus and then he, called, he showed up and he talked like Pontius Pilate, that would have been good news. But he looked and talked. He, he was the genuine article, we would call it. So some might say, well, so why are you talking about that? How does that apply to me? Jesus hasn't manifested himself to me. But I would answer that by saying, come on now. Jesus has manifested himself to you. Okay, the Apostle Paul never saw Jesus in union, union body, but he sure saw Jesus, did he not? Did he not? And I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 9.1. He doesn't say, you know, I've seen, you know, you ask people, have you ever heard from Christ? Man, you can get some in -laws. You can get some really interesting answers. He can be where he wants to be all the time. 
And I don't need to see Jesus with my physical eye. He's been made manifest to me by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks that. says that no man can declare that Jesus is Lord except the Spirit of God does it. Okay? The Spirit of God reveals uh, Christ to us. And He shall testify, it says, He shall testify of me, meaning the Spirit. He will show you me. Uh, a very important section of Scripture, John 15 and 16 want to understand that whole thing. And I dare say, it's an absolute fact that maybe some of us need to be reminded of it every once in a while, that every Christian who has ever lived on the face of the earth has, is, is, should have had a personal, intimate revelation to the person of Jesus Christ. True? Yes. Okay. It's, and, and, and it's not only, you can't always say, you know, well, well when I was saved, uh, when I was 15 years old, I saw Christ. Uh, you know, it's it's a constant, ongoing presence within your life. It's a spiritual discernment, Sally. Spiritual discernment. Of, no, Sally and I are talking about spiritual discernment. It's spiritual discernment in your life of, in regards to the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did manifest himself to you, definitely, positively, when you were saved. And he did that in order that you might know that he's alive in your life. Just as he went to his uh, apostles and manifested himself to them, he manifests himself to you today for the exact same purpose. Listen, I couldn't preach a Christ that I had never met. How could I do that? You know? I, I, I wouldn't do that. I want to have I want to have confidence in the product that I'm speaking about. And I know this product, and Jesus reveals himself to those that are his. I like what it says in 1 Peter 1 8. Whom having not seen, you love. Who you haven't seen, you love. That's who that's who our Savior is. We haven't seen him, but we love him. That's a good idea. So, can you love somebody you can't see? You can't see him with your physical eye, but you can see him. He's as real as this podium. Uh, he's as real as any of us. Sometimes I think he's more real than us. Because he's always, he's always, he's always one thing about Jesus, he ain't going to kid around with you. He ain't going to say what, he's not going to tell you something to make you feel good. He's going to tell you what you need to hear. So he's real. So he gives them, so Jesus then, he gives them, okay, we said he gives them the proper message, okay? Then he gives them a proper manifestation. So you've got the equipment to do the job, right? The facts, you've got the message, you have the presence of the living Christ that has been made manifest to you. And here's the third thing, and I'll close uh, with this tonight. Yeah, this third one. Uh, the idea that you have the you have to have the proper might, the proper might. Now you might say, you know, well I've got the facts, and not only that, I've got those facts down. I know him. I'm ready to go out, and I've seen Jesus. He's manifested in my life, and here I go. Wham! I'm out of here, and I'm going to go out and do the job. Watch me. Here I go. And I know people that have done that. I think the disciples were ready to do that. They were ready to get on out there. They had the facts. They had the, the indwelling. Uh, they were going to receive the indwelling, indwelling of the Spirit. And Jesus says, okay, wait. You haven't got all that you need yet. You need this proper might. You need this indwelling of the Spirit. Uh, after Jesus got done teaching them, they had the facts. They'd seen the resurrected Lord. He manifested himself to them. They're ready to go, and he tells them, and he tells them the good commission, the great, the great commission goes, tells God into all the world, you know, and declare, uh, you know, his word. And they're, I think these guys are fired up. It's like a, a speech before the football game. You know, the coach comes up and tells you, get out there and uh, strangle those guys. But then... This is one of the strangest commands in the Bible. What does he tell them in verse 4? Don't, don't do anything. Yeah, wait. Uh, 
Now that doesn't apply to me and you today. Don't take that, okay? Because this is a different age, okay? We're into the Holy Spirit age. They weren't. He wanted them to wait for the Holy Spirit age. In verse 4, and being assembled with them, the idea of assembled means they were probably having a meal. Jesus loved to, loved, loved to have meals. You always read about him going to lunch and dinner at different people's houses. That's right. That's why, that's why we're so close. And the implication of the words there is that they command, that he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So, evidently, that so they, they, it would seem that they were ready to go. They were ready to go on and go out, and he tells them to wait. And I mean, they had the facts. They'd seen the resurrected Lord. Or Lord. They were committed in their love to him and to serve them, and they're ready to go, but he says, don't go anywhere for a while. I want you to wait. Wait until something happens. You must wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. Okay? Now, he had promised them, he had told them that the Father had something special for them. And now he says, people, I don't want you to go anywhere. I, I want you to wait here for the promise of the Father. And it's interesting, if you look at Luke uh, 24, 49, it says, Behold, I send the promise, with a big P, of my Father upon you. Uh, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued. Uh, that's a Greek word. We get the, uh, the word endow, endowment, from that, that Greek word. Uh, with power from on high. So whatever the promise of the Father is, it's got something to do with what? With what? Power. With dunamis in the Greek. It's got, it's got something to do with power. So uh, you, you, you can understand that. Whatever it's, it is, he's got something he wants to empower them. And that's an important point because, listen, you can have the facts, you can have the manifestation, and you can run on out and do it in your own power and what will happen? You'll fail. Happens all the time. People get a great idea. I had a guy come to me a year ago, probably a year ago, talking to me about a men's ministry for men's. Sounds like a great idea. Feels led of the Lord to develop a men's ministry in men's. I said, that's a great idea. I'll do whatever I can to help you. You tell me what you want me to do, I'll help you. You can use our facility, whatever you want to do. I never went anywhere. Because it was something he wanted to do. I don't really think he was led of the Lord to do it. It was something that he felt had to be done. And, and, and it, it's become, actually, it became a stumbling block in his walk. It actually led to failure in his life. So, you've got to have, it's like, you can have the nicest car in the neighborhood, but if you ain't got an engine, <laughs> that car ain't no good. You've got to have an engine. And the engine is the power of the Holy Spirit. So, he says, the promise of the Father, he says, he, he tells them that he, he's told them about it. And if you look in John, and they come in John centric 739, 14, 16, and 26, 15, 26, 16, 7, 20, 22. I think I put those in the outline. In all those places, he told them that the Father was going to send them something. And he's not real specific because they're not going to understand the specificity of it if he tries to explain it to them back then. And, but the promise of the Father is indicated then to us specifically in Luke 11.13. You know, Luke is a very accurate historian. And it says in Luke 11.13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to, to those who ask Him? In other words, if we're able to be good to our kids and we're evil, and we have an essence of evil in us, then how much more will the Father be able to bless us? So, what's the promise of the Father? Luke said it right there. He said it was the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 2.33. I'll read my version. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, 
That word therefore is very important. Okay? It's therefore a very important reading. Acts 2.33. Am, am I in the right verse? Yes. Okay. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, because Jesus did what he did, therefore he was exalted. That's what that means. Because Jesus did what he did, therefore he was exalted to the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. That's the Father's promise. The promise that he would send the Holy Spirit. Now you see, Jesus had said in John that the Father cannot send the Spirit until I go to the Father. He says, I have to go to the Father. There's, a, there's a, almost a trade of the Trinity happening here. I go to the Father, and then the Father can send the Spirit, in a sense. And the Spirit is sent, I, I believe, if you look into the theology of it, as a reward for faithful service of the Son. Uh, Philippians speaks to that idea. So when Jesus was to go back to heaven, then the Father would send the Spirit. And so he says, uh, you're going to have to wait a little while. And you know how long it is? about 10 days. That's how long they have to wait for the Spirit. Okay, uh, They had to wait, I don't know why 10 days. Evidently Jesus went up there, got, had to get things arranged in a certain way, spent time with the Father. I don't, I'm not sure of everything that goes on in heaven. In fact, I'm not sure of very little that goes on in heaven. I don't know, but then after 10, approximately 10 days, uh, the Spirit came down. But he says, I, I can't do anything uh, until uh, you, he tells them, you, I don't want you to do anything until he gets here. And that's, that's, that's a good thing to remember for you and I as individuals. But you have to see, you know, and that's the point I want to make here. What he's pointing out to us is that he's pointing out to us the absolute hopelessness of you doing anything in your flesh. God don't want your fleshly works. God wants you to work in the will of the Spirit can't get things done for God when you do it in yourself. You just can't do that. You can make all your nice plans. You can make all your, put together the details. You can run it on your own. You can, you can do it in your own strength. Okay? But when you do that, it'll be like uh, banging a bucket in a dry well. You ever heard of that phrase? Bang. You know, what, what sense is there to drop a bucket into a dry well? All it does is climb around on the bottom and sides, okay? It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't amount to anything. It's a, it's, if, if you do these things, if you try to do things for God in your own energy, it just isn't going to work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the picture is Peter out there. He's seen Christ. He's out there fishing by himself and he doesn't catch anything because he's doing things in his own strength. So, what this means is uh, and I'm not saying that, that, that the idea isn't that, that this doesn't mean that they never understood anything about the Holy Spirit. Okay? Of course not. They knew, they knew of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 20, you remember, they were sent out on a marvelous commission by the Lord, sent out to preach the kingdom, and Jesus said, It is not you who speak, but uh, who? The Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So they knew that the Holy Spirit was with them when they went out in that sense then. Luke 12.12, 12, For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to know. When you go out, the Spirit will be with you and, and teach you what to say, and even the Spirit will speak through you. The implication is they knew about the Spirit. John 14.17, John Jesus said, He is with you. Okay, speaking of the Spirit, He is with you. Right then He was with them in John 14, and then it says, He shall be, and then He says, He is with you, but then He, sh he shall be, He says, He shall be in you. Okay, that hasn't happened yet. He's with you, but He's going to be in you. And that's what He's saying here. The promise of the Spirit was that the Spirit was with uh, the Spirit was with them, but one day He would be in them. Now that's very different from today, okay? Because you see in the old economy, the old dispensation, uh, the 
before the, the falling of the Spirit, the Spirit would come and go according to need. Okay? Uh, if, you're going, if you're going to do a special work, if the Lord needed a special work from you, the Spirit would come, and when the work was done, the Spirit would depart. The, the, the Old Testament talks about Elijah. The Spirit of God descended upon him, and then, when he, the work was done, the Spirit of God departed. And that is how the Spirit of God worked. Never an indwelling, but just a moving in and out for specific purposes. And that's the promise that the Spirit will come. Now, Christ says, this is the promise that the Spirit will come and it will be in you. That's John 14, 17. One of the, really one of the key verses in the Word of God. Uh, there's, uh, yes, Gordon. Yeah, what does it mean in uh, Psalm 51 when he asked the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from I think I think that David 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 lived in a continual process of having the Spirit with him, and then having the Spirit depart from him, according according to his 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 life, which was always uh, often convoluted. But this new ministry is defined in verse five for us. Okay, it says, "For John truly baptized with water." Okay, John the Baptist, and he's called the Baptist. Because he baptized, not because he was a Baptist, all right? Or the Baptist denomination then. But John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay? Not many days. So he just says, just sit around, cool your jets, wait until the Holy Spirit comes, and you'll be baptized by the Spirit. Okay? And he's introducing them to a tremendous fulfillment of the promise of of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is so essential to Christianity, so unique to Christianity. Uh, the indwelling of uh, spirits in other religions is usually an indwelling which is put upon adherence to those religions so that they can be manipulated by their deity. This is a totally different thought process in the history of religion. This is a spirit that comes upon us, that works through us, and uses us to fulfill God's work on the earth. Not to besiege us, but to allow us to become part of God's plan. And way back in John 1.33, John the Baptist said that there's coming, there's going to come to this, there's somebody new coming. And he's going to baptize you different than I'm baptizing you today. In verse 33 he says, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is who the, this is the Son of God, John the Baptist says. It is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Is, uh, so you see Jesus goes back to heaven and then he begins the spirit the, the spirit falls and then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they couldn't go anywhere till they had been baptized by the Holy Spirit and that's the way we function today okay now I'm not going to do a big uh, dissertation or uh, treatise on the theology of the baptism of the Holy Spirit I will do one I'll do that in connection with chapter 2 when we get into all that involved when the Spirit of God baptized them on the day of Pentecost and they spoke of, in other languages. One of the most confused uh, sections of Scripture in the Bible. And we'll cover that at that particular time. But at this time, it, it is suffice to say that we stand here on this principle that these gentlemen needed to have the right power and that power was the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay. So you can't do anything then. That's our picture today. You can't do anything in your own energy. It can't be done. You can't do it in your own strength. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to come about ten days later. It's a totally unique experience. The Bible says now that it happens to every believer. It happened at the moment you received Jesus Christ. And... Uh, and I'm not telling you that today it's ten days after you're saved. Today, it happens then. Okay? You get the Spirit, because the Spirit's there. The Spirit is the one whispering in your ear. 
and, and, and so I'm not teaching it's a 10 day duration, it's a 10, it was a 10 duration, 10 day duration then, because that was a transitional historical period that we're studying in Acts 1. It's different now. They were, they were waiting for the first coming of the Holy Spirit. And from then on, the Spirit of God indwells every believer at the moment of salvation. Because if it, if it didn't function that way, then Romans 8 9 would be a lie. It says in Romans 8, 8, 9, Romans 8, 9, it says, He that has not the Spirit of Christ is none of his. Okay? So the, 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 what it says is that to be a child of God, you have to have the Spirit. So, and that is, a, that is an instantaneous transaction that is made on your behalf. Okay? And the, his that's spoken of there in uh, Romans 8, 9 is Christ. The person without the Holy Spirit is a Christian. A person without the Holy Spirit isn't a Christian. A person without the Holy Spirit isn't even a Christian. There's a lot of people that you can talk to them about being indwelled by the Spirit. And they, don't, and they go to Christian churches and they don't have a clue what you're talking about. But a person who does not have the Holy Spirit isn't a Christian. And that means a Christian has who? The, when we speak of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit has to indwell us. And that's what makes you discerning. That's what allows you to understand. That's, that's the, without the Spirit, you can go nowhere in your Christian walk because you are not a Christian. So the baptism of the Spirit became then the pattern for all believers at the moment of their salvation. Okay, And there's one baptism... And there, uh, you know, the Spirit can, uh, there's one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there, the Spirit can move in your life in mighty ways, in different times, in different circumstances, in different, uh, in, in completely different ways, but there's one baptism, okay? And that's where you get the power, that's where the engine is installed in the car. From that moment forward, you have the ability to do what you need to do. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready to turn on the key and step on the gas? Because when you start down the road, it's not always smooth. Okay? Sometimes it's bumpy, sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's difficult. So a lot of Christians, they turn on the key. They take it and put it into drive, they start down the road and they get scared and they stop and they turn it off and that's it. And that's the end of the Spirit's utilization in their life. They sit in churches, they sit at home, a lot of them, and they never are used of the Spirit again because they, they are overwhelmed by what is in front of them. So can't go anywhere unless you're willing to call on the on the spirit and that's a very beloved beloved that's a very practical thing for you to understand okay and I'll add to that just a little bit down in verse 8 and then I'll wrap up this thought look at verse 8 in our in our source chapter in chapter 1 but you shall receive receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. See, the idea is that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't generate any, anything on their own strength. They had to wait until they were empowered by the Spirit. And that's that word, dunamis. dunamis. It's that Greek word that we get, uh, dynamite. It's a verb, uh, and, and it has different, slightly different meanings uh, according to the way you use it. It means to make strong, to confirm, to strengthen. It, but it's the word we get, the English word we get from it is dynamite, the idea of power. And that's, that, that, that's the idea that the Christian possesses the Holy Spirit. And it's your, your, that Holy Spirit in your life is literally packed with dynamite. So do you feel like you're exploding? Are you being used like a piece of dynamite? Uh, you know, I've talked to some people 
in, in counseling, and they, they, they told me, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm being used like, like a piece of dynamite. I feel like I'm being used like a dud, you know. Uh, where is that power in my life, Steve? You know, why, why don't I have that power in my life? If I have this Holy Spirit that you talk about, and, and, I, and, and, and I'm supposed to be feel, filled and I'm supposed to be a divine dynamo, okay, with divine energy. Where is that energy in my, my life? Well, if you're a child of God, it's there, right? And if you're a child of God, it's not God's fault that you haven't turned on the ignition key. It's there. You're, you know, you are to be a supercharged Christian, you know. How do you turn on that key? Well... Turn it on in Ephesians 5.18. Okay? You want to turn on that key? It says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And, you know, Charismatics will use that in that verse uh, to, to, to say different things. But what that verse is saying is, is that Peter, uh, Paul is just saying, you, you need to be Filled with the Spirit so that the Spirit is a controlling influence in your life. That's how you turn on the key. That's the key to the whole thing. You need to be, you need to be turned on by the Spirit. A simple illustration. I've used it in a sermon that I've taught before on the Spirit-filled life uh, on, in Ephesians 5. And that's a good place for a new Christian to study if you have friends that are new Christians. Send them to Ephesians 5.18. But it's the idea, the idea of, uh, do you remember fizzies? Do you remember fizzies? Fizzies were these little uh, flavored pills, which uh, they were kind of like, they were kind of like Alka-Seltzer. You remember Alka-Seltzer? And that fizzy, that pill was nothing until you did what? You dropped into a glass of water, and then what happened? It went crazy. It, it went fizzled up, and it changed the color of the water, and it changed the, the, the way the water tasted. The Holy Spirit should be a fizzy in your life. He should, he should change the way you look in your life. He should change the way you feel in your life, the way you taste in your life. He is a concentrated form of energy that wants to release power in your life if you let Him do that. That's what the Spirit of God wants to make you like. He, he wants to make you. See, God wants to fill. See, Christians, we want to compartment. We want to compartmentalize our God. We want, to, we want to put Him in this part of our life. But your life is a real big thing. And Christ wants all your life. He wants to permeate your life. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God wants to be your life. And that's, that's the issue. That's, that's where you lose power because you, 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 you're the one that has to push down that power in your life. If you remember what it was like to come to Christ, I believe when you come to Christ, you are spirit-filled. You've got 100% of everything you're going to get. You're not going to get any more. You're not going to have a second baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay? Some will teach that. I don't believe that. The question is, have you ever removed the... And so, what happens is, is that because we are satisfied with certain parts of our old life, which is actually sin, we place a lid on the Holy Spirit, and we do not allow certain parts of the Spirit to be released in our lives. Christians hang on to their sins, and you know why? Because Satan has convinced you that they make you feel comfortable make you feel good, and since they make you feel good, because he's lied to you, okay, it's just like people, I've, I counsel with people that have such poor self-esteem because they've believed a lie that Satan has foisted upon them and used other people to reinforce in their lives, and they've believed that lie, and now they've, they've gone for it, hook, line, and sink. And they've allowed that lie to place a lid upon their lives. And they've gone through their life 
Remember, I've talked to you about pulling that big, big, big bag through the airport full of your old life. Get rid of that big footlocker. Get a little travel on bag. You're going to be besieged by sin each and every day. Every time you are, give it back to the Lord. It's an easy bag. He'll take it from you. But when you get burdened by sin repetitively, it becomes harder and harder and harder for you to get rid of because you don't allow the Spirit of the Lord to work in your life to help you to get rid of it. Okay? So then when the apostles not saved until the Spirit has nothing, no, it has nothing to do with their... Uh, you, don't, you don't want to equate uh, their salvation at that time uh, in history. Was Moses saved? Where is he? He's in heaven, according to the Hall of, of Faith. So yeah, don't equate don't equate that time in history to indwelling of the Holy Spirit with salvation. You can equate it today in this dispensation, in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, but don't equate it in that day. Because there, Samson is in the Hall of Faith, is he not? David, who else? There's some. There's some. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some people in there just like me and you. So, yeah. No. I know what you're saying. What else? Yes, Paul? I want to see if I can this. Okay, so when you're, when you're a victim, you say you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Huh? And so, like that fellow that wanted to start the men's ministry, he, he had... He, I'm assuming he was saved. Yes. And he had the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. But he was out of God's will. Yes. So that's why it that's why it didn't work. Yes. So so a lot of people that are saved and have the power, they go about decide things don't work because you know I don't mentioned sin, but it's all it's also well, it is sin, because it's sin of self. You know, I've known some of the most sour and dour people in the world that told me they're supposed to be greeters. I have. How does that work? Is that their gift? No, but it's something they aspire to. And it's those aspirations which are the sins of self. This guy, and I believe that the Lord could have used him, and may one day use him for a great men's ministry. As soon as he gets the sin out of his life. That's how I think it tells him what it is. Speaking out of God's will, you're doing it. You're, you're, you're sinning. Yeah. That's every time you step out of God's will for your life, you're sinning. Yeah. You're doing what you've determined you should do rather than what he's determined you should do. And listen, God has great and mighty things for everybody. If you if you look at it from God's perspective. Because God God says, what does Jesus say? The first shall be last. You know, Jesus says if you want to have victory, lose the lose and you'll have victory. You want to be strong, be weak. The most mundane of tasks, if it supports the kingdom of God, is as great as any task. I believe it will be rewarded. I believe we will be rewarded. Our true barometer of our rewards in heaven will be how we function within God's will in our life. Not the great things we've done. Because, you know, man has, we use, we use that word great. Man uses that word, I've done great things for God. Well, anybody that's in God's will is doing great things for God. It's not. By, by God's will, that's following His command. His, yeah. his command that's... It's seeking his will in your life. It's doing what he wants you to do rather than what you want to do. And that's why, and you don't know if you don't, well, first of all, so how do you know God's will? Well, you've got to ask. Do you ask? Secondly, if you want to know, you've got to listen. That's even a harder one. Do you listen? And then thirdly, if, if you ask and if you listen, and then if he tells you, you know, because sometimes people don't like the, the answer. I think God answers all prayers. Yes, no, and wait. 
sometimes that weight is something else. I want you to do this for my kingdom. You know? Anybody else? I'm sorry. No, that's fine. So if that guy had the right heart,